we looked at the history of legalized marijuana in the U.S. and elsewhere. And we've talked a bit about tax revenues that the industry produces. Which brings us now to part two, the business dimensions of, the, of legalized marijuana. Uh, Paul, you're one of the recognized experts on the emergence of the cannabis industry. So let me begin by asking you to A, describe the industry, some history perhaps, where it stands today, and also the structure, how it's kind of organized. Sure, yeah. One thing I've concluded, and I think it, it motivated my interest in studying this and teaching it, is it really is a unique industry. So uh, I think lots of folks um, have an inclination to try to map it to the tobacco industry mm -hmm. or the alcohol industry, whether it's beer or wine. Uh, the pharmaceutical industry. And I think there are some elements that are, are similar across maybe one or more of those, but really this is a unique combination, uh, partly because of the product, but also because, as we talked about in the first part, the, the regulations state by state, country by country, really set up a very different um, rules of the game kind of at each place as we go. Um, so to describe the, the marijuana, the cannabis industry in general, I think it's helpful to think of the value chain. So mm -hmm. you know, step one would be cultivation. You're growing an agricultural plant um, that has some elements you know, similar to other agricultural plants. Mm -hmm. you, you think about your indoor, outdoor, greenhouse options, you know, fertilization, pesticides, you know, pe you know, all the loss due to pests, et cetera. Um, then you move into, in some cases, a second phase around manufacturing. So not uh, all and increasingly less of this product is sold in its raw form, kind of as, as flour. But more and more you have a manufacturing phase where you're taking the raw plant uh, and then processing it into just a, a extracted oil or some sort of edible product, a cream, all sorts of really amazing uh, variety of beverages, et cetera. Um, so think of that as a second phase. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the third primary phase would be the retail phase that I think many people in, in a state that has legalized are most familiar with because they drive by it or perhaps sure. they've visited. Um, and, you know, and that has mm -hmm. a lot of similarities to other retail um, industries, but at the same time, it's unique in that customers and, and producers are learning a lot as we go and the product variety is really in uh, flux. There's some supporting pieces behind the scenes, you know, testing, um, you know, all the professional services, um, transportation, et cetera, but really thinking about cultivation, uh, production, manufacturing, and then retailing as th the three phases. Uh, and then uh, you have this complexity of a medical and a recreational. So in Colorado, mm -hmm. as I mentioned also in the earlier uh, piece, uh, we've set up two parallel systems so that uh, every plant, when it's first uh, entering the industry, <laughs> I guess, as a, as a seedling, is allocated to one, uh, the medical side or the recreational side, and never shall that plant uh, cross over. So, you know, it's, it's tracked, you know, by weight all the way through the process. Um, and that's true generally of, of everything along the way, a separate license to test one versus the other, a separate license to retail medical versus recreational. So that's, that's our Colorado model, pretty evolved. Most jurisdictions that have gone to having both medical and rec have, uh, have both of those elements kind of operating side by side with some differing rules. Um, and then from a, a business competition point of view, I think you, know, you see some things that are similar to other industries. So as the industry is maturing, there's a trend to consolidation of maybe a, a smaller number of larger companies taking more and more of the, of the market, although that's still in early phases. Um, there's definitely a, a branding and kind of an educational piece of trying to build up awareness about brands and products and mm -hmm. how they're used and what their benefits are. Uh, and I think, you know, there's still a, a big efficiency kind of cost challenge, right? So if you can find a way to grow outdoors or in a greenhouse, that may be more uh, advantageous than an expensive warehouse facility in a city like Denver. And so on all those fronts, there's just lots of change and lots of uh, fluidity. You mentioned uh, structurally sort of the agricultural dimension, the manufacturing and the retailing. Let me uh, go back to your earlier uh, uh, observation about the regulatory environment. Can you talk a little bit about the, how the regulatory environment affects each of those m major phases? Yeah, and I think one thing um, that's hovering over all these is this is a federally illegal industry in the U.S. <laughs> And so you know, that, that has a, an impact at all phases. So in the uh, cultivation side, typically we look to um, the federal government to define things around uh, pesticide standards, you know, quality standards. Mm -hmm. um, that's not uh, accessible to, to folks in the industry. They're having to look to state um, officials, and in some cases states are having to figure out some of those standards. But it's really a state-by-state uh, state process. Um, and I guess it maybe it should be said, too, this is um, federal legal, so interstate 
uh, commerce or any sort of shipping of the product outside of the state's boundaries would also be uh, strictly prohibited. So e everything that happens agriculturally today is within a state, which is quite unusual you know, compared sure to our is. tomatoes or our strawberries, which are flying all over the country and all over the world. Yeah. Um, at the manufacturing level, um, you know, I've visited a number of these facilities and I've taken uh, students to see them. Um, there's a really interesting mix of uh, equipment and machinery that's been brought over from other industries, whether it's uh, you know, laboratory equipment or bakery equipment or, uh, or any sorts of, uh, of you know, big manufacturing pieces. And then you've got uh, folks developing custom and new applications um, for this industry. Uh, and that, and that, that phase is one where I think you know, scale and you know, safety, you know, quality mm -hmm. is, is definitely a, a paramount interest. And then when you get to the retail end, um, you know, it probably ends up, you know, being more similar to, you know, a grocery store kind of analogy, right? So you walk into a dispensary in Colorado, which uh, if you haven't done it, uh, it's a little bit overwhelming. You've got a beverage section and a, a these edible products, some creams, maybe something for your pet, um, and then the traditional kind of flour in a jar, I guess, that people might have initially um, pictured around this, this plant. So, you know, a lot of their challenges are around staffing and retention and service. Um, and also this challenge that we have a, a medical profession and a medical industry that's used to deferring to the federal government. And so we're really in a little bit of uncharted territory here where we've legalized this product for medical use, but the FDA and the typical um, national voices are not there to guide the medical right. profession. And so I think, if anything, the medical side of this industry is not as fully integrated with the rest of um, our, our healthcare uh, world uh, as some might imagine, you know, since we've been doing it for a while, or might want because, you know, things like having my prescription covered by my insurance plan or sure. being able to talk to my family physician about interactions or substitutions, uh, some of those things are just not happening because of that federal status. So that's really hanging over every part of the industry. Well, as you mentioned, um, marijuana is illegal at the federal level, and I, and I I know that introduces uh, a number of complexities. You've touched on a few, but uh, for example, I know banking regulations are a problem. Could you talk a little more about that? Yeah, there are many, and <laughs> I, it's, a, it's almost a, a great exercise in, in prompting us to think about what does the federal government do within a country. So one, as you mentioned, is banking. The federal banking system is where most of us um, you know, receive our paychecks, write checks, make withdrawals, credit card payments, uh, and at this point, the the federal banks, those are chartered federally, are, are very cautious about um, serving this industry because they know it's, it's federally legal. And so they're in a real um, catch-22 situation of, you know, they can't really prove the, 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 the federal, you know, worthiness until it becomes legalized. And so, you know, right. the, the guest speakers we have in my class speak at length about just how much of their time is spent trying to find a compatible banking partner maybe that works for a little while and they have to move to a new one. And also lots of issues around handling cash as opposed to um, electronic payments, which you know, it's not something they're doing uh, voluntarily, they're being forced into that situation in many cases. So that's one example of the banking. Uh, taxation would be another. So um, you know, it turns out that back in the 90s, the IRS had a, a case involving a cocaine uh, smuggling operation in Florida and set precedent that any sort of federally illegal business doesn't receive the typical uh, tax uh, deductions, particularly around you know, business uh, expenses. And so we have companies in Colorado and other states fully compliant with state law, but when they go to file their federal taxes under this provision, which is known as 280E, kind of a, a word that would make people cringe in the industry, um, they can't uh, access the normal deductions, and so their effective tax rate may end up being 80 or 90 percent particularly depending on how vertically uh, integrated they are. So it's kind of behind the scenes, but yet a, a key uh, challenge for these companies. Um, there are others too, intellectual property. You know, we think of patents and mm -hmm. trademarks. Those are typically uh, sought at the federal level, and, and that's not really available uh, in most uh, cases at this point. Um, the interstate commerce or any sort of uh, cross-state operations, as I mentioned. Um, so yeah, having a federally legal business be deemed legal at a state level not only is it unusual, it's just a very complicated uh, environment. And I think lots of companies have, have run into trouble. Uh, and you know, to add insult to injury, if you happen to go bankrupt in this industry, you also wouldn't get federal bankruptcy protection. And so you know, we, we've heard of stories in Colorado where companies, not only have they struggled and failed, but then they also have another set of challenges that other businesses don't face, even just in, in closing out with creditors. So. so when we think about the evolution of business, 
we always think about it on a, on a national or a global scale. And here you've got a kind of a mini operation because it's restricted to the, to the state, is that right? Yeah, and I think you can see um, pros and cons to that, right? In, in one way, the states are acting as a laboratory of mm -hmm. experimentation, right? Mm -hmm. I think, as I mentioned, other states have been able to learn from Colorado. I think the federal government is learning a lot by watching these different states and what they're doing and maybe uh, at, at some point in the future, there'll be a, an option to bring some of those best practices up to the national level. Um, but on the other hand, it, it really has put the U.S. in a unique position relative to other countries. So when, when I mentioned Canada legalizing mm -hmm. nationally this October, um, companies there won't have to deal with the tax issue or the banking issue or the intellectual property issue. Uh, they'll have access to import and, and, and export uh, eventually to other countries because their country has, has deemed this to be a legal industry and uh, is ready to have those connections. You know, today we can't even uh, make joint ventures in other states in a, in a typical way, let alone mm. other countries. Uh, and I, I think there may also be benefit in Canada of helping the medi uh, medical community and profession be more integrated with uh, an industry that's fully legal at the national level. So hopefully mm. uh, those who have been really advocating for more research, you know, more um, study of, of what happens when uh, a community and an individual um, starts consuming this product, that may happen more quickly in a place like Canada or other countries that, that move nationally. And it may take quite a bit longer here in the U.S. So um, this has been most interesting. We've talked about the environment, how it's changed, the industry. You, you really have a wonderful position to look across all this with your research. Um, where do you think this is headed in the U.S. and, and I guess globally as well? But um, Share with us where you think we're going. Yeah, well, as you mentioned at the beginning, my, my interests come from studying business and government, and I think obviously there's lots to be thought about there. But even before that, I think other disciplines you know, that we have around our campus and, and around academia are relevant too. So I don't think we should overlook just the need for medical understanding, right? This product was, right. was really prohibited for so long that there was no opportunity to do the typical types of mm -hmm. uh, medical research and, and, and social work, uh, research, that type of thing. So that's obviously a piece I think that legalization will help with and over time, you know, that should help inform everything that happens in the business world or, or you know, public policy, et cetera. Um, yeah, the, the policy decisions at the federal, state, and even local level, I think that's an area that's still really in its infancy. You know, what, what does a given jurisdiction want to allow or not allow? Um, and uh, there's lots more to be figured out there. Uh, and then on the business side, you know, more in, in my area of focus, I think that, that trend towards consolidation and potentially you know, big business as opposed to kind of a crafty business, um, mm -hmm. that's something to watch. You know, People look to industries like wine, where there's that um, that split. You have the big national, international mm -hmm. brands, but you also have local, very unique craft type um, producers. That same kind of split in in a market like beer. You know, at, at, at times in the past we didn't have that as a country, but now mm -hmm. we're in a in a state in Colorado as a place where where you see that uh, regularly. So that's an area to be, to be thinking about. And a couple of key topics that cut across you know all these uh, disciplines. One would be social or public consumption. You know, as a state in Colorado, we had so many priorities to address in these early sets of regulation. We didn't really provide an example for other places on how we should allow or not allow public consumption. We just kind of banned it outright, and we're still pretty well in that world with a, a few small exceptions. So that's an area, I think, where there'll be opportunity for progress and, and better consensus. Uh, and a related one would be around uh, impaired driving. So there's a, a sense and a, a realization that people are consuming this product for medical or recreational reasons, uh, and some of those people may be um, driving vehicles, but what we're lacking right now is a real clear understanding of what that means for safety, what are the best practices. I think it, it's, it's clear this is different than an alcohol or, or another product that we may have dealt with uh, for longer, but um, just lots to figure out there too. Uh, so yeah, it, it's early days. I think you know those in Colorado who have a sense that We've kind of been there, done that, everything's <laughs> been figured out. Uh, it's probably not the case, right? These things take decades and not years to, right. to crack. Yeah. So uh, your research in, uh, in this area is just most interesting. Um, what issues do you think our viewers might be thinking about or discussing with others uh, as they think and, and try and sort through this issue? Yeah, I think a couple that come to mind. One would be, um, at a personal level, thinking about what the pros and cons are of this process we've entered in Colorado of legalization, mm -hmm. which also seems to be happening uh, increasingly elsewhere. Um, 
it, it's definitely has pros and cons, and the, you know, I think it's worthwhile thinking about both. Uh, and kind of one thing that struck me is the, uh, the alternative to legalizing cannabis is not no cannabis. It's uh, cannabis exists, but it's in some other illegal black market type of uh, structure. And so th that might be something to think about as mm -hmm. you do compare the pros and cons. Um, and then the second question, I guess, which might be of interest is to think about personally, how does the legalization process affect uh, affect you maybe in terms of your career? Um, could be directly in that you have an opportunity to, to engage in this industry or, or connect with it as a lawyer or an accountant or a marketing professional, uh, you know, a teacher. You know, so many of our, our industries are somehow um, are gonna have an impact, but maybe even just more indirectly that we're citizens in a state that has this new uh, industry that has economic impacts in a variety of ways. Um, and then also, you know, personally for, for family members and for, for loved ones who may have medical needs or may choose to use this product. Um, you know, I think that's something to, to think about too. And I, I guess I've, I've been um, surprised at how folks outside of Colorado assume that everyone in Colorado has kind of figured this out and that we, you know, <laughs> not just, you know, as an industry, but personally that we've really wrestled with all these issues to the full extent. But again, I, I feel like this is something that really will be an evolution over time. Um, it's, been, it's been pointed out to me that if, um, if certain products like tobacco or alcohol or cannabis just showed up today you know, for the first time, that as a society we might take very different views of how we regulate and, and, and view those products. Uh, but that's not the way it happened. It was very much, you know, it's been an evolution. So alcohol has a certain um, place in our, in our perspective that kind of evolved over years. Tobacco, pharmaceuticals the same way. Uh, and now cannabis has really taken a, a, a turn in that, and uh, and who knows where it'll fall out, but I think that's part of the, the process that we're going through. Well, Paul Seaborn, thank you so much for sharing your, <coughs> your knowledge about the legalization of marijuana and particularly the emergence of the cannabis industry. I hope you'll join us in the future as we bring more engaging ideas from the academy to the community. I'm Jim Grisma. Thank you for watching.